Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com. We're going to hear the story of a woman who died earlier this year, a few weeks after giving birth. Her name was Shalon Irving. She was in her mid-30s. She was black. NPR's Renee Montaigne and ProPublica's Nina Martin learned about her at the beginning of an investigation into the high rate of maternal deaths here in the U.S. Within that alarming rate is an even more troubling one. Black women are three times more likely to die than white women. Sometimes it's an issue of poverty, lack of prenatal care, or not having access to the best hospitals. Racism also plays a role. Experts say prolonged exposure to bias is so stressful it can make the difference between life and death. Here's Renee. It is an especially cruel irony that Shalon Irving was focusing on the exact issue of how racism figures into health. Armed with a Ph.D., she was rising through the ranks of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she researched the many ways the body can be negatively impacted by its surroundings. By any measure, Shalon had accomplished a lot. Highly educated and well-paid, she owned her own home and had access to the finest health care. Yet none of that protected her from becoming part of the shockingly high rate of black maternal mortality. So they can you see hi? Hi. On a recent afternoon, we joined Shalon's mother, Wanda Irving, in her home outside of Atlanta. She was surrounded by photos and mementos and caring for the baby Shalon left behind when she died from complications of childbirth. There's a picture of her and Soleil with the same outfits that was taken the day she collapsed, the morning of the day she collapsed. Soleil is French for son. For son. She just lights up a room when she smiles. And she's the only reason I have for getting out of bed every morning. The fact that in 2017 America, a black woman is still three to four times as likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth, and that there are twice as likely to suffer a life-threatening complication, I think that's a national disgrace. Dr. Michael Liu spent years as head of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. That's the main federal funder of programs for mothers and infants. He and others have done studies showing that an important cause of poor outcomes in childbirth for all black women is prolonged exposure to the indignities and dangers of discrimination. We're talking about African-American doctors and lawyers and business executives, and they still have higher maternal mortality rate than uh, white women who were high school dropouts. It's the experience of having to work harder than anybody else just to get equal pay and equal respect. It's being followed around when you're shopping at a nice store or being stopped by the police when you're driving in a nice neighborhood. Those types of experiences create a kind of chronic stress that continues to gun the engine, which over time create the wear and tear on your body's systems. There is a word researchers use for this accelerated deterioration of the body. It's called weathering, and some studies suggest it can be measured at the level of chromosomes. One study looking at the chromosomal markers for aging found that middle-aged African-American women on average appear seven and a half years older than their white counterparts. 
The lead author was a pioneer in the study of weathering, Arlene Geronimus of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Long-term exposure to cascades of stress hormones causes a lot of different health vulnerabilities, and it increases your susceptibility to infection, but also the early onset of chronic diseases, in particular hypertension, diabetes, morbid obesity. Weathering and chromosomal indications of aging can occur in anyone. One study, for example, showed similar weathering in white mothers caring for autistic children. The core problem is lifelong unrelenting stress. And for African-American women, pregnancy becomes an even more dangerous time. Pregnancy is a big stressor on the body, and a healthy body can adjust and adapt to it. But a body that's worn out, will have a much harder time and therefore putting the woman at greater risk. Photos of Shalon Irving show a vibrant woman, river rafting with friends, posing in a silky evening gown. At 36, Shalon would be categorized as high risk, but added to that, a black woman who is, say, 35, can be biologically closer to 45, a far greater risk for giving birth. And beneath Shalon's broad smile and healthy glow lurked many of the same issues that beset less privileged black women. Shalon had already lost both of her siblings, a baby brother in a car accident, and then her beloved older brother, Sam, died slowly from MS. As a primary caregiver, Shalon fretted over what she saw as subpar treatment being offered to Sam because he was black and on Medicaid. Then last year, Shalon got news she had long hoped for. She was pregnant but soon found herself single when her relationship with the baby's father fell apart. These traumatic life events do add to the risk of pregnancy. Along with Shalon's history of surgery for uterine fibroids, which meant she would have to have a cesarean, she was overweight and taking medication to control a blood clotting disease. Still, her mother says, Shalon managed to overcome all these risk factors through to the very end of her pregnancy. It was a great birth. It was just just a beautiful time. So the problem didn't come in until after the birth, and she didn't have an afterbirth plan. In fact, a few new mothers do. Obstetrician Elizabeth Howell is known for her work on racial disparities as a professor at Mount Sinai's Icon School of Medicine in New York. We've had a long standing history in this country of just sort of sending moms out. You know, they've done the big thing, they've delivered the baby, and now they'll they'll heal, they'll be fine, and, you know, that's actually not true, right? In fact, the CDC finds that more than half of America's maternal deaths occur postpartum. Fully a third of those happen at least a week or more after giving birth. Monica McLemore is a nursing professor at the University of California, San Francisco, now leading a major effort to reduce premature births among black women. Her research involves scores of focus groups with black mothers. And so one of the things that has been very striking from the focus groups that I've conducted is that people feel disrespected during their care. They they talk about not being believed. They talk about reporting signs and symptoms of deterioration and not having any real action that occurs. Numerous studies do support the existence of implicit bias in the treatment of black patients. And in a survey recently released by NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Harvard's Chan School of Public Health, one-third of black women said they had been discriminated against because of their race when going to a doctor or health clinic. One in five avoided going to a doctor or seeking health care out of concern that they would be racially discriminated against. Monica McLemore has found that anticipation of bias can also disrupt key communication between a mother and her provider. One of the patients who was talking through her birth story was going on and on and on about how she has no game face. And she says, people who know me know that I have very emotional reactions. And as a black woman, I've learned to curtail that because I don't want to appear to be angry all of the time. But one of the things that was really difficult during her birthing experience was she was working so hard to not appear to be angry or to not appear to be in pain that every time she spoke to the nurses and and requested pain medicines, they didn't believe her. And so she really was trying to suppress what her natural facial expressions and responses were because she didn't want people to be buying into stereotypes about black women and particularly whether or not we're angry. 
context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade, and for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Monday, December 11th, 2017. So I have been told uh, we should be back on Wednesday. Uh, David Newert, white male, uh, he just wrote the book Alt America, should be on the broadcast this coming Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Broadcast for today, the segment, the audio segment that you heard at the beginning, uh, NPR just did that report about three days ago. If folks remember, if you've been listening to the cows, at least for the past week, uh, we just had Marsha Jones on the broadcast <clears throat> one week ago uh, with the AFIA Center down in Texas, doing great work uh, trying to help Black mothers, uh, black parents uh, providing resources so that they can have healthy children. She was just on the broadcast on Tuesday of last week. NPR did that report about two or three days after Miss Jones was on the program. And I said, oh, wow, we were just talking about this and we're going to be talking about this again. I was telling folks uh, from last week that I thought this issue uh, is important, one that we should be focused on. I think some people, the conclusion that they've come to, if we want to solve the problem of racism, white supremacy, then we should put a very high premium or a very high value on black children and the whole process uh, of pregnancy and child rearing, that we should take that very seriously if we want to solve this problem. Uh, to that end, continuing with the subject matter, joining us on the broadcast for today, she established the Healing Hands Doula Project specifically to address this issue, uh, the alarming disparities with regards to maternal mortality rates, uh, specifically in the Texas area, although this is a problem throughout the United States. Uh, you can visit the Healing Hands Doula Project. It's linked in the description to the program. Uh, she also contributes to the Mamas on Bed Rest and Beyond. They have a podcast. They have lots of resources linked online, uh, lots of information to help uh, pregnant mothers or if you are have just given birth and are still looking for additional information uh, to help with the whole process wealth of wonderful resources check it out also linked on in the description for the broadcast really thankful she could spare a bit of her monday evening to share some time and insight with us joining us live for the broadcast our guest miss darlene turner miss turner you're with us yep i'm right here Spectacular. Thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. Uh, for our listeners, I'm sure this is some of our folks' first time hearing about you and the work that you do. Anything you would like to share with us before we get started? Well, um, geez, let me think. I mean, if you've had Marsha on, I think you're really well-versed in the problem. Marsha's up in Dallas. I'm a little bit south down here in Austin. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of battling the same beast of maternal mortality and um, as you probably know, Texas has the highest maternal mortality rate in the country, and we also have the highest rate of uninsured individuals, and, um, you know, we just have a really huge problem down here. And as Marsha and I, we talk about it often, we just feel like we have to take the lead on this because we've both testified before the legislature, we're at varying roundtables with people at the state, at the county, at the city level, and we're both just baffled because it really does not seem to be urgent on those agendas. And we're like, you know, women are dying. <laughs> and they're like, well, they're going to wait and see what the studies bear out. And the studies bear out that women are dying. But, you know, we both question whether it's because black women are dying that there just isn't that same urgency. So you know, we're, we're kind of joining the bandwagon of several other different programs around the country headed by black women who are just saying, you know, no more. We cannot have black women dying. And for listeners, just to make sure we understand, when you use the term maternal mortality rates, uh, what does that term mean specifically? Uh, the maternal mortality rate is um, an indicator of maternal death per maternal deaths per 100,000 100, women, and um, 
Oh, let's see. Texas, we've currently got one, and I'm thinking because I have Travis County, which is my county's numbers, and then I have Texas numbers, but we're hovering around 13.5, 14 per 100,000, where that number for white women is like five. <laughs> so, you know, clearly there is an issue. Um, you know, and with Hispanics women, that number is about three per 100,000. So, I mean, we are just outpacing women of other ethnicities clearly by about three to one. And we're talking about maternal deaths around um, childbirthing. And it's, it's just unacceptable because, as NPR has reported and several other entities have reported, you know, when everything is held the same, you know, when we account for age, socioeconomic status, education, smoking, everything else, if we keep everything the same, those numbers remain the same. So we're not getting the same protection from education, higher social status, higher income, better prenatal care. We're just not faring well. And everybody wants to scratch their head about it, but I think it's really clear in the NPR article and for those of us working in the field, it is clearly racial bias that is causing the deaths of black women and black infants and really kind of on this end of things decimating the black family. Wow. For folks who have not seen you, uh, you are a black female, Ms. Turner? Yes, sir. I am. Right on. Just making sure. Uh, this, bo- <laughs> this broadcast, uh, I use the term racism and the term white supremacy. I use those terms as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, the definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, Do you think such a system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? That seems pretty on point to me. I mean, you know, we can look at the systems of how things are going currently in the United States. I, I haven't really looked as diligently at other nations, but United States, we are in the throes, the thick of what I call a a mass genocide of people of color. Um, You know, so many people wanted to say, oh, we're post-racial after Barack Obama was elected. And while that was a huge, um, I think some of us saw it as a victory, it also just reared the ugly head of racism in this country because there were some people, I mean, and I think a larger percentage than many of us even thought that were just incensed because their sensibilities were white people are supreme and for a black man to essentially beat them at their own game was just, yeah, I mean, it, it just blew their, blew their minds. And, you know, we're seeing it in the current administration. We're seeing it in our congressional people. You know, when Mitch McConnell can stand in the congressional halls and say, my one purpose is to see Barack Obama as a one-time president, one-term president, and to undo his legacy. I mean, who says that? Who can stand there and say that? And, again, if the tables were reversed, you know, a black congressional person to say something like that, it would never be tolerated. Some of the things that happened to President Obama would never have been tolerated. And, you know, from on high all the way down, we are seeing this just backlash of, I think, pretty brutal racism from the police brutality to the prison issues, um, you know, school to prison pipelines, and now we're seeing it in maternal and infant mortality. I think there is an all-out genocide to just eradicate black people. Make it plain. Appreciate that, Ms. Turner. <clears throat> um, I when we talk about this subject matter or really anything related to children, I always make sure to concede to our listeners: I do not have children. Uh, you are a mother, Ms. Turner, is that correct? Yes, I have two children, um, a 15-year-old and an 11, almost 12-year-old. 
right on. Uh, did you do the natural childbirth route, or did you do the traditional hospital birth? I did hospital births. In fact, I was not unlike um, Ms. Irving. I had uterine fibroids, and I had two pregnancy losses. I had to have surgery to be able to carry my children. I had a very traumatic birth with my daughter, my first pregnant, my first successful pregnancy. She wasn't my first pregnancy, and um, bled profusely, although they say it wasn't a hemorrhage because it wasn't enough blood, but, you know, by a lot of people's standards, it was a hemorrhage. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really pretty ugly. And again, she was born early. She was preterm, low birth weight. I hemorrhaged. I mean, everything that we're talking about and yet, you know, was married and we had insurance to the hilt. I started, um, prenatal care, like almost the day I found out I was pregnant and none of it was protective. Wow. Wow. Did you, at that time, did you think racism is contributing to some of these health problems? At that point, I didn't think about it as much. I noticed it more when I was having my son. Um, you know, because I was also older. I was 40 when I had my son. And, you know, so we, having had my history by that time I got pregnant with him, I had um, a traumatic pregnancy, I'd had the surgery, I'd had two losses, and we were talking about bed rest and everything, and, and actually, on the scheme of things, his pregnancy was really pretty low-key, but I was on restricted activity, and, um, you know, after I had him in the hospital, you know, in comes a social worker with all the Medicaid and WIC information, because, of course, I would need this never looking at my chart, seeing that I was married, that we had private insurance and the whole nine yards. And it's these types of things that, you know, the assumptions that I'm automatically going to need public assistance and I'm automatically, you know, not going to be able to care for my children and that, you know, we have to step in and help you. And, and I asked her, I said, oh, do you bring this into every woman or are you just bringing it in for me? Because I knew I was the only black mother on the floor at that time. And she got all right. Well, I just thought maybe. And I said, oh, I know. You just thought I needed it. But if you want, you can wait. My husband will be here. He stops in every day before work. And you can explain it to both of us. And she just looked at me like, <laughs> and And quietly exited out of the room. But, you know, these things go on. They're constant. They're persistent. And while... You know, I don't know. I've never looked at my, my chromosomes. I don't know what my chromosomes look like. But yeah, I have a lifetime of that, that nonsense going on. And I think about it a lot now because of my daughter, you know, what's going on with her chromosomes, what's going on with her at the cellular level, because she comes home and people will say things to her that they just feel they can just say things to her. And that's, that's kind of the nature of how things are for black people. People feel like, you know, they want to talk about our hair, they want to talk about our weight, they want to talk about anything. It's just fair game. Whereas if the situation is reversed, then we're being insulting, and how can you say that? And you know, I mean, it's crazy. That is racism, white supremacy. Uh, there is a black mother that I know, and speaking exactly to your point, she said one of the things that irritates her, stress, right there, stress, racism, white supremacy. Oh. And she's still not out of her first year from when her first child was born. Uh, but she said that one of the things that consistently irritates her is that if she's out and about or just it seems to be consistent, even sometimes when she's at her own residence, that people just kind of show contempt for her as a black mother, like they will publicly rebuke what she's doing as a black mom, like her skills are somehow implied that she's inept. Uh, as a parent, uh, or will just disregard her wishes uh, in terms of what she wants to be happening with her child. Like she feels like that sort of thing happens on a regular basis. And she feels like a lot of it is rooted in the fact that she is a black female. Like, do you have uh, tips to kind of help black females, black moms kind of push back against that constant contempt? Uh, the one thing I would say, and I, I think about this often because I've had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with folks, um, 
more so now that my son is older and, you know, in school. And I was shocked that the BS, I'll just leave it at that, started with him at six. And I had to go at it with his first grade teacher because, you know, nine days into school, oh, I think he has ADHD. And I had, my head whipped around because I'm a physician assistant by training. And I said, excuse me? Well, you know, he was speaking up in class. It turns out she had made a statement and he corrected her on it and she didn't like it. Now, you know, you could say, I don't like that your child spoke out out of turn or whatever, but to say he's ADHD and he should be evaluated... And I promptly said, well, what makes you say that? And she said, well, my 25 years as an educator. And I said, well, my 12 years as a clinician and having evaluated children with ADHD, they have these eight different points and he has none of them. So where are you, how are you basing that on a cumulative 54 hours of time with him, of which I know you haven't been there all 54 hours because they have lunch and they have special classes like music and PE. So what are you basing this on? And then she got kind of quiet. But it's, I think, unfortunately, we have to be armed with the facts. And it is that, again, adds to the weathering because we are constantly vigilant, constantly having to have our ducks in a row, knowing our facts, knowing our, you know, what what is our right in, in having to advocate for our children. But I ha- I know no other way to be because... I am not going to let someone take advantage of or slight one of my children. And I'm doing my best not to have it happen to me. Um, In terms of parents, I would just say be really firm, firmly grounded in how you want to raise your children, and then just Go at it full force, stand guard, stand your ground, because they are your children, and your children have no one else to advocate for them besides you, and, you know, besides their parents. And, you know, you just have to do it. It is hard. I, I agree, and I think um, if the person you're speaking of has access to a mom's group, I was in Mocha Moms for many years when my children were small, and that was invaluable. I have um, some remaining friends from that. And then as my children have been in school, whenever I meet black parents, we get together, we talk about things. You have to have a network. You have to have support because it will wear you down and really take a toll on you. And I find with my children, if I see, you know, any of their friends who are, you know, not being treated well, you know, I step in or I make sure that I speak with the parents like, hey, I saw this happening with your child. You may want to check that. And and they do likewise for me. Um, you have to have support. Have to have support and also really know what you want to bring to your parenting. Context of white supremacy. Again, our guest, Miss Darlene Turner, uh, founder of the Healing Hands Community Doula Project. Uh, with the incident with your son, was his female teacher classified as white? Was this a white female teacher? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Someone has talked before about the danger of white female teachers with black children, boys and girls, but that is another broadcast. Uh, <laughs> with the uh, with yeah. with your with your work specifically, I know when we had uh, Miss Jones on last week, we asked her what sort of literature she recommends for new parents or even folks who want to come and volunteer with her. Do you all have literature that you recommend for for new parents? Oh gosh, um, I don't have literature that I recommend specifically for new parents. I have things that I, well, let me think about that for a second. Because I really feel like, um, and I'm dealing more so with the moms and the dads. Occasionally, the dads come through, and it's not that I'm, um, you know, putting them off, but I just tend to deal more with the moms. I talk to them about um, really being grounded and what they want for themselves. And I think part of the reason it can be so unsettling when things happen with our children is because we haven't resolved what's happened with us. And so I love the work of Bell Hooks. 
um, Sisters of the Yam is, is one of my all-time favorites. I love um, Susan Taylor has written a lot of op-eds and things in essence, and she's had a couple of books that she's written, and I'm trying to think of. One was In the Spirit, which was a collection of essays, and she had another book, and I'm blanking on it. But I find that moms have to be better at taking care of themselves. And it's very easy to get into the, I'm going to do this for my child, I'm going to do this for my children. And that's all well and good, and I think it's important. But one of the things I'm doing with Healing Hands and what I've done with Mamas on Bed Rest is to keep the focus on moms. And whenever a mom tries to say, well, I need to do this for my child, I'm like, you need to lay down. You know, you need to rest. You need to do, you know, you need to eat. Well, I'll do that after I feed the children. No, you need to eat because especially if she's breastfeeding, if she's not eating, she's not going to be effectively making breast milk. I mean, she will, but it's also going to be breaking down her body. So I try to get women to focus more on themselves first and then try to take care of their children because when you're armed, so to speak, and when you're strong, then it's easier to take care of others. But when you're trying to serve from an empty cup, it's really hard. What is your recommendation? The black mother that I was uh, speaking of specifically, she's in an area where they don't have as many black people. Uh, In fact, she said consistently when I mentioned that you were in Texas, like, oh, this would be a lot easier there because there would be many more black people available uh, to access. What's your recommendation for folks who might be in an area where they have fewer, fewer black people to depend on? Well, I have to say, I'm in Austin, and we are only about 5% of the population, so we don't have a whole lot. Yeah, Austin has dwindled significantly, even since I moved here in 2000, where we were about 7 or 8%. We're down to about 5 um, I still recommend, you know, if she can, to, to bond with other um, black women, or black parents. Um, if she is in an area where there aren't a lot of black parents, then go online. Um, a couple of places that she can go, and I'm going to pull up on my Facebook because there are a couple of sites that I would recommend. Um, one is called um, We Got Us, and it is um, moderated. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, Graham Seabrook, she is a certified lactation consultant, and she does a lot of uh, coaching of moms, especially black moms. And uh, she started a site on Facebook, We Got Us, where black women, we just go on and talk about whatever. And if, if the mom you're speaking of is not able to have local help, then she's got to go for the virtual. Get on Facebook. There are several, I think Mocha Moms even has a Facebook page, but Mocha Moms is national, and I would be really surprised, unless she's in like Montana or something, that there isn't a Mocha Moms chapter somewhere. Now, it may be far from her, it might be a drive, so again, get on Facebook, check out Mocha Moms, check out We Got Us with uh, Graham Seabrook's group. Um, There are other parenting groups on Facebook that are primarily um, black, moderated, black-owned, black-run. And and you have to have that because you will go crazy just in this this very kind of whitewashed society we're living in right now. And even if people aren't outwardly, you know, poking at you about how you're being, sometimes you're just in that space. And it just does not resonate with you at all. You know, you hear people talking about what they're doing, and you're thinking, I would never do that with my child. <laughs> and and it's not that it's necessarily bad. It just has no resonance with you whatsoever. And so you're sitting there like, well, hmm, you know, what, what do I do? What do I say? Because none of what the other women are talking about makes any sense or has any relevance for you. You know, it, it, you have to have that support. And like I said, you know, we have so much technology now. You can FaceTime with people. You can Skype. You can Google. You can Zoom. You can. I mean, there are ways that even if you are not in physical proximity, you can interface with people like face-to-face now. Um, 
across hundreds of miles. I mean, I have friends in England and Europe and, and just all over the place that we jump on Skype and we're chit-chatting. So I would recommend that she join some of these online groups and within that she will meet people who she, you know, developed a friendship with, a relationship with, and then they can Skype back and forth, they can FaceTime, and, and she can kind of develop that tribe that she desperately needs because it, it's hard. Parenting is hard. And, you know, even if you find, like I'm finding I'm parenting a little bit different than my parents parented me, and sometimes they're the ones giving me the, well, you know, we didn't do that with you. And I'm like, yes, I know. That's why I'm doing this this way. You know, that you want to do something different even from your parents. So you're not getting even that support or you're getting the raised eyebrow like, mm, that's not what we did with you kids. And, you know, so you're getting it kind of outside and inside. So you need that tribe of people that you can bounce things off of and just say, gosh, you know, I'm having a day. And someone gets it. Unmuted. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I'm going to suggest, I was trying to find the We Got Us with Graham Seabrooks. I was struggling a little bit, but I'm going to continue looking and I'll post it as we continue through the broadcast. I'll put it on my well, Facebook. See, it may be closed. Let me see because I have my Facebook thing up here. I guess while you're searching for the folks who uh, were calling in uh, for the folks on the call line, uh, we might the audio might have been down, but it's working. You should be able to hear. So if you were listening via the phone line, you can feel free to chime back in. For the folks listening online, it should have been fine. So you can continue listening. Uh, I'll give out the number again if you want to dial back in at 641-715-3640. And the code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. Uh, were you able to track down the page, Miss Turner, or still looking? I did, and I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, let's see, you should be able to find it. It's a closed group, but you can ask permission to join okay and so if not um tell people they can like email or find like go to mamas on bed rest on facebook they can message me and i can kind of see if i can do a loop to get them in to get them to graham because i don't think like it's coming up on mine but because i'm in the group mm -hmm. i can't tell if if it's not um finding you can't find it through search Okay. So if they can't find it, it's just we got us. And if they can't find it, you know, they can send me a message or something saying, you know, I'm a mom or I'm a black woman. I really want to join this group. I can see if I can get them in that way. Okay. Outstanding. I'll uh, post it on Facebook once I find it myself. You, you all offer uh, parenting classes uh, with your healing Healing Hands Community Doula Project, what what sort of things do you cover in the parenting class? Ooh, well, I'm so glad you asked about that one because the parenting class that I'm working on, the parenting project, I'm working on in conjunction with a really wonderful gentleman here, um, Kenneth Thompson Sr., and he is a fatherhood advocate, and we've been on several different committees and what have you here in Austin, and... Um, you know, one day he just asked me, tell me about, you know, Mama's on Bed Rest and Healing Hands. And I was telling him, and he said, oh, that sounds like something I need to tell my guy's partners. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he has a whole fatherhood program. He's on the radio, but he does a lot with um, the men and, you know, explaining, you know, the importance of their role and, you know, why it's important for them to be present for their children and for their partners and so we have paired up and have been doing, um, just starting, but doing parenting classes together where I talk a lot about, you know, childbirth and the mom, role of mom and healthy eating and all that. And he talks about the role of dad being present to support that. And one of the things that we are strongly trying to get across to people is, you know, sometimes things happen, you make a baby, but the two of you are not feeling each other. 
that you need to somehow come together, find a common ground to raise your child. Um, it is real important. Um, I was telling him about um, going to support a woman during childbirth, and she had had some preterm labor contractions, and we went in, and her partner was out of town that weekend, that this wasn't time, and they treated her horribly. I mean, I was floored at how badly they treated her, and I was you know, a half step from writing the hospital administration saying, you know, you cannot speak to women like this when they come in. Like, why didn't you call your doctor first? And I'm thinking because she thought she was in labor. That's why she came in. And as her doula, I stated that. And, you know, her OB kind of looked at me and I said, well, what else was she supposed to do? Well, she should have called first. I said, well, she wasn't sure. So she came in. That's appropriate. But four days later when she was in real labor and her partner was there and, you know, I went up to meet with her and, you know, we're getting ready to do the whole baby thing and he was quietly sitting in the chair while they were weighing her, doing blood pressure, the whole nine yards. And the person who checked people in at the desk was the same, the triage nurse was the same and the OB was the same. And you would have thought this was the first time they had seen her. Oh, how are you? Oh, look at you. This is great. This is wonderful. And I'm looking at them like, are you the same rude people who talked down to her and basically chastised her for coming in four days ago? And I couldn't figure it out until her OB went to her partner. Oh, that's so nice to see you. And he was fine. And when she left, I told him what happened. And he was like, really? And what I have found is that when black women especially go to the hospital on their own, even with a doula, even with a girlfriend, they are treated differently than if their partner is there. And he doesn't even have to say anything. He can just be quietly sitting there, but the the treatment of her is different. And somehow, I guess, in their mind, they feel like she's somehow better or something because she's, you know, partnered up or what have you. But the difference in how women are treated when a male partner is present is, to me, staggering, it's inappropriate that this happened, but I've said to people, that's what it takes. I'm going to start renting some men to just, you know, when I know a woman is on her own, come and sit in the room. Just come and sit there because there is this definite change in demeanor that I'm seeing from hospital staff when women are on their own. Wow, now that is... Do you ever need an encouragement uh, to make sure that you are just present? Uh, that right there is substantial. I, we, it, that reminded me, Bernelia Randall, she was a guest on that program back, well, she's been a guest repeatedly, but the first time she was a guest on the program in 2009, she highly encouraged if you are a black person and you have to go to the hospital for any reason, make sure you take someone who is healthy so that they can advocate for you, that that can greatly improve how you will be treated uh, when you go in to get your services. This added wrinkle, uh, if you're pregnant, if there's going to be uh, a birth, then make sure you have the dad, make sure you are present. Uh, just your presence alone, as she stated, seems to have a huge impact on how everyone is treated. Uh, we, I, I was just going to add in really quick what you said also, uh, just about the way that this black female was treated when she went in just she had concerns uh, about what was happening and she was treated in such a a rude and distasteful manner that right there uh, I mean in in terms of stress in terms of racism but I mean if that's the reception that you get when there could be a problem what happens the next time if something happens if you don't feel correct or or what have you are you going to be thinking oh I don't want to go back because they might chastise me again you know at the hospital like I don't want to get them really upset or what happened I mean what are, what are the ramifications of that in terms of your your long-term care that is exactly what happened so when she finally went into actual labor uh, several days later she called me and said, okay, I'm finally going to go in. I, I, you know, I think I've been in labor since 2 in the morning. It was about 6 in the morning. And I said, okay, and, you know, I'll get up. I'm going to meet you there. And she, I said, well, you know, asked if her partner was in. She said, yes, he's going to take me and everything. I said, okay. She said, yeah, I'm bleeding. I was like, what? <laughs> and, she, you know, it was just that um, the mucus plug had come out and everything. But she bled a little. And, I mean, that was concerning to me. That was concerning to her. But she had waited a couple of hours. 
And what if that hadn't just been her mucus plug, but she waited because she didn't want someone to yell at her and say that, you know, you're coming in again. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter if it's false labor or not. If a mom has concerns, she should be able to go into the L&D triage and have her questions and things answered. Okay, maybe she should call her OB and whatever first, but my thing was, if she's bleeding, I don't want to sit here and banter back and forth about what's going on. I want her at the hospital, which was completely indicated. And I had to hustle up there because by the time she went in, she was eight centimeters dilated. I mean, you know, so then we're playing, you know, beat it to the hospital to beat the baby out. And, you know, everything worked out fine. She had a beautiful baby boy, a great labor, delivery, the whole nine yards. But, I mean... She had to then second guess herself because of the previous time, like as to whether or not she should even go in. And then she's far advanced when she went in. And that, that's, not, that's not okay. You know, she had concerns. She has every right to go to the hospital and have those concerns addressed. Context of white supremacy. Again, our guest, uh, Ms. Darlene Turner. Uh, do you have uh, a position or thoughts, views uh, in terms of cannabis use for pregnant mothers during pregnancy? Do you have views on whether or not that's a healthy thing to do? I personally do not advise my, my women to use cannabis or alcohol. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, a glass of wine is fine. And I feel like substance abuse in our communities is so widespread that rather than peter with it and try to figure out just how much is okay, um, and I haven't read good re- – well, I, let me slow down. In terms of alcoholism, we know that even though the mother may actually clear the alcohol just fine with her liver, we know the babies don't and fetal alcohol syndrome is real. Um, a lot of people say, well, it's just one glass of wine. Well, yeah, mom will clear it in three or four hours. The baby can take 12 hours or more just because of the immature system. So I, my thought is and my feeling is why introduce that to the infant who then has to work so much more to clear it. Um, in terms of, you know, and I also say to women, so why is it so significant that for these nine, ten months you have a glass of wine. I mean, it's, it's really on the scheme of your life a very brief time. So, I mean, that is my personal thing, and that is what I work on and talk to my clients about. I know there are other practitioners who have different views on that, but I do feel like because of the different um, stressors on African-American women on their bodies, which is then transferred to their babies, and, and just because of our maternal and infant mortality rates, the complications we endure, why add something else that really doesn't need to be there? Um, In terms of cannabis, I don't know the rates of metabolism in infants. I haven't really studied that. Again, for mothers, mothers will clear it. Now, we have to consider that The pregnant woman, her body is doing some different things, so I don't know if she's going to clear it as well or as quickly. You know, I don't know enough about cannabis and pregnancy to adequately address this, but kind of my thought is I tell my clients not to. Now, if they have a medical condition for which it was prescribed, I then send them back to that practitioner if that's the case. But in Texas, we really don't have that, so it's not been an issue. But um, my gut kind of knee-jerk response to that is don't do it just because the data really isn't that clear on the developing fetus, developing infant, that I'd be kind of like, I'm not sure what's going to happen, so why try it? Why risk it? I know. It seemed like there would be more data. I think when I was asking other people, uh, it didn't seem like there was lots of data on the subject matter. So, yeah, it's one of those, uh, I, even though what you just said, that 
that is very lucid. That makes a lot of sense. You know, why, if you're not certain, why introduce, you know, anything that could be questionable during such a, a brief period, uh, nine months, not really that big a deal in, in the scheme of things. Uh, if folks have uh, questions they want to ask, the number 641-715-3640, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star six one if you have a question. Uh, Ms. Turner, have you seen any sort of correlation between uh, abortions and any later uh, problems during pregnancy or any correlations between uh, previous abortions and maternal mortality rates? I have not. And actually, that came up in a, um, I was at a conference oh, six months to a year ago. And there, you know, we live in Texas, the Bible Belt here, and, you know, there are always people trying to say, well, you know, if you have an abortion, you're going to, you know, have more preterm labor or more um, pregnancy complications. And that really, as far as I've seen in the data, has not been the truth. Um, well, and, and I want to add that if a woman is allowed to have a safe and healthy abortion, that is not the truth. Now, again, I live in Texas where, you know, so many of the abortion clinics and providers, what have you, have been run out or defunded or shut down and everything. So there are very limited um, facilities available that are able to perform safe, medically um, competent abortions here in Texas. So... um, with that being the case, if a woman's kind of getting what we used to call the back alley abortion, I can't say that she won't have subsequent problems. But when a woman has access to a safe, medically sound therapeutic abortion and there were no complications with the procedure, there were no, um, you know, she didn't come into the procedure with any, you know, pre-existing conditions or whatever, she should be able to go on and have subsequent pregnancies with no problems. It usually does not um, indicate that she's going to have preterm labor, premature births, or anything like that. That is not the case. That's at least not what the literature is saying, and that's not what I have seen in clients that have had um, a prior termination. But again, you know, what concerns me is that with all of the restrictions on women's health care and you can't do this and you can't do that and you know we're banning this because it might be an abortion and I mean we we just have the looney tunes down here in Texas that we may start seeing more complications with childbirth in women who may have had a prior termination because it was not done um, according to what we call medical protocol and so, you know, then you don't know what happened. And, you know, and that's what is so tragic. That is what is perilous to think about is that women may be going to providers or to places that are not up to standard and are not following, you know, standards of care, so to speak, in getting, having problems, having you know, damage done to their organs or to their bodies, and, and that that is very concerning to me. When we had Miss Jones on the program last week, uh, she said, uh, and pretty emphatically, that with her work with the AFIA Center, that them taking an explicit stance that they are trying to help pregnant Black mothers, uh, and Black mothers specifically, it's not Uh, people of color. And she said that she felt if they had taken the stance that, oh, we're about helping, you know, everybody or uh, people of color and not we're about helping black mothers, that they would get better funding, that things, it would be much easier for them to uh, get resources. Uh, You all also make it pretty explicit that you're about helping uh, black mothers and, and correcting the racial disparity with regards to maternal mortality rates in Texas. Have you all do you, have you had similar difficulties with regards to funding? Yep, <laughs> and similar difficulties getting people to even 
listen to what I'm saying to the, I mean, Marsha and I have had this discussion many times and, you know, we, we equally shake our heads because I've had, I've had white women just be fit to be tied because I had a woman call and she said, I want to be a doula for your program. And I could tell on the phone this is a white woman. And I said, well, um, I appreciate your interest, and it's, but um, I don't think that you would be a good fit. And she went on to tell me about, you know, how much experience she had and all this. And I said, well, the reason I designed Helen Hands Community Dual Project was for black women to take care of black women. I will take a guess, but I don't think you're a black woman. She says, but no, but that shouldn't matter. And I said, but it does matter because a large part of the problem in this country is that black people cannot or have not been able to historically in the past trust white practitioners. And that has led to a lot of, like you're saying, women are disrespected. They're not going to go back to that provider. And what we're trying to do is to kind of fill the gap of being someone they can talk to, someone they can get resources through, someone they can have go with them to a, appointments and things. And I just don't feel that for this particular project, having white people or Hispanic people or, you know, dealing with black women is beneficial. Now, it makes them feel good. And quite frankly, right now, I don't give a crap about them feeling good. My focus is on taking care of black women because right now we're getting short into the stick and many of us are not being taken care of. And, and that's just the long and the short of it. Now, have I gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with folks over at UT? Absolutely. Have I gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with folks at the varying hospital? Absolutely. I have missed funding opportunities, and I know it's because I have specifically said this program is for black women. I've had people call, do you have materials in Spanish? No, because most black women are not speaking Spanish. And I'm, while I would never say to a Hispanic woman, I won't treat you, I would treat her, but for this program, she's not a fit. And why she would want to come here, I don't even know. But it's definitely... I know we're both being challenged on that, and I know we're both getting a lot of pushback on that because people feel like, well, then you're being reverse racist. I said, no, I'm being careful. I'm being very specific in terms of marketing. I have an ideal client, and she is a black female. And when I say that, then they're like, well, I'm not. And I said, yeah, my ideal client is a black childbearing female. She is not Hispanic. She is not Asian. She might be mixed. I don't know. But basically, I am going after the black childbearing female. And it's not like I know we've both probably taken our wallops. And, uh, you know, Marsha has been at this a little bit longer than I have. But, um, yeah, I know, I know there have been areas where I've not been funded or I've not been, you know, invited to speak or whatever. But what's interesting now is because of the work we've done and because we are the ones on the ground going into the communities, talking with women, being with women, supporting women, now everybody wants to talk to us because they realize they don't know jack about what we're doing and they're trying to make these programs that aren't working. And now they're kind of coming around going, well, gee, everybody knows because it's been national news. Texas has horrible maternal mortality and maternal birth outcomes, now they want to talk to us because they realize if we don't get these ladies on board, we may not figure this out. Context of white supremacy. Again, our guest, Ms. Darlene Turner. Uh, some of our listeners, they saw the report. I posted it earlier. I think she published the essay in the LA Times, Ann Simmons, maybe a month or so ago, talking about this problem. She labeled it the quiet crisis. And she referenced a lot of, she referenced Ms., uh, Marsha Jones' work with the AFIA Center and a number of other uh, resources uh, for black mothers specifically. And when I posted that, reposted uh, that article last week, several of our listeners 
they were incredulous. Uh, they read the L.A. Times report and basically I'm, I'm summarizing uh, their the doubts that they had. Uh, they said basically that frequently there will be statistics published about black people uh, somehow suggesting that we're defective or that we suffer from all these problems and pathologies that these sort of things happen all the time and that sometimes they're just false. Uh, they will publish some made up statistics about black people and they were saying that I think this the the suggestion that black females specifically have these really high maternal mortality rates uh, I do not think that that is true. I don't think that there are tons of black females that are suffering through pregnancy or in the first year after pregnancy. Uh, can you address folks who would say they have some suspicions about those statistics? Are these black people saying this? Yes, ma'am. Wow. Wow. That's, um, <laughs> well, the only thing I can say is go read, go read the data. Go read the papers. Um, and I think... I think there is, let me think, how do I want to address this? There is an element of, an, of disbelief because I know when I first started Mamas on Bed Rest, I started that in 2009, and my mother thought I was crazy. She was like, what are you doing? You know, going to these people's homes and, you know, helping these women. You know, who, who was hiring you? And I started telling her, Mom, you know, every year some 750,000 women go on bed rest naturally. She was Lord, she had no idea much of what's going on in this country in women's health and women's childbearing. People just don't know. We, we drink the Kool-Aid of, oh, it's just so lovely and wonderful, and the heavens open up and the angels sing it. Everybody has a healthy baby. And it does not happen like that for many women, black, white, Hispanic, and otherwise. But when we're talking about Black women, more often, I mean, I think I did a, um, uh, it was at a church, and we were talking about this, and it was like, at first people were like, oh, what do you mean, maternal mortality? And I said, okay, how many of you know, how many of you have either had a loss or know someone who's had a pregnancy loss? In the room, I don't know if there was anyone who didn't raise their hand. And then they looked around and were like, my God, I think part of what happens in the black community especially, we don't talk about stuff like that. You know, either your family may know, your close friends may know. But again, in this, I don't want to seem weak. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. You know, we're going to just muscle through, and and this is my own personal whatever bias, whatever we, you know, well, it's God's will. And we sweep a whole lot under the rug in the name of it's God's will, and I'm not going to complain, and I'm not going to question the good Lord, and, you know, blah, 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 and we can go on. And we don't talk about it. So then, and then, we get mad when other people talk about it. The other thing is, is black people are taking this as a, it's a blemish or it's, it's something defective with us. And the bottom line is, I don't, it's not something defective with us. It's something that's being done to us. And I am very clear on that. My great grandmother was a granny midwife from 1931 to 1953. She birthed hundreds of babies. Um, in Forks Township, North Carolina, Warren County, and I had a chance to go down and read the birth records. They have amazing records down there. I, I mean, like her handwritten records, it, it just gave me chills, but this wasn't happening then. And the thing that's different is back in the day before 1950, before the specialty of obstetrics became a medical specialty, black women primarily birthed black women, to care of black women, because basically white folks couldn't give a hoot about what was going on with us, except when you're talking about slavery as to whether or not we're having babies to make them more money. But how we were birthing and who was taking care of who and who was birthing who, they didn't care. So black women were taking care of black women. And if a woman was, you know, she was a field worker or whatever, and, and as my grandmother wrote on one note, it's near her time. I have to have her come in out of the field. The other woman picked up the slack. So if she had to go on, quote, unquote, bed rest or she needed to be down, the other woman picked up the slack. 
but we didn't see a lot of preterm birth. We didn't see a lot of low birth weight infants because women, you know, even though they were giving us the scraps for food and we had horrible, you know, sometimes living conditions, there was the sense of community. And when a woman needed, another woman was there to pick up the slack. Well, here we roll up to the 1950s where white folks decide that, you know, obstetrics is a medical specialty and it needs to be done in the hospital and it needs to be managed by white men. That's what the long and the short of it was. And they basically ran the granny midwives out of business. And my grandmother, my great-grandmother, she, she started out kind of going to the hospital and they're checking her bag and what are you using and what are these herbs for and and she writes, she's written some things down that my great aunt showed me and said, you know, they, some of these people, she said, I have birthed probably their parents. They don't know what they're talking about. And she went in and saw the birthing wards where, you know, these giant rooms where women were supposed to give birth. And she was like, what is this? This is personal. You don't birth in a room with other people. You birth, you know, privately. And um, they were going to force or to take some sort of test or something. And at that point, she was like, I'm not taking some sort of test. So she, um, she said, forget it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So she retired. But my great aunt, Alima, who's now like 94, when I was, you know, researching all this, said, you know, Ma said, nothing good is going to come from this because they are not at all thinking about what is best for black women. They're just thinking about what's best for them. And she said, you watch this because they're charging women $50 for a birth. That was you know, the going rate back then. She says, how are these women going to pay $50 for a birth when they can't even pay me $5, which was her rate? And she said, you mark my words, this is not going to go well because they're not accustomed to treating women as true patients. And she meant black women. And, you know, this is this is had long standing. We have a long standing history of this. And you know, folks don't want to admit, they don't want to talk about our history. <laughs> and the reality is <clears throat> we've had a lot of things happen to us, yet we feel the shame. And and you know, we have to stop feeling ashamed because we have nothing to be ashamed of. We did not withhold care from us. We did not you know, withhold nutritious food from us. We did not withhold adequate shelter from us. We did not withhold jobs. We did not withhold money. This was all done to us. And it has perpetuated throughout generations and has, as the piece at the beginning of this discussion said, it has weathered us. It has changed us. It has done things to us. Now, is it permanent? I don't think so. I don't know. I'm not a geneticist, and I have not looked at, you know, things going on at the cellular level all the time. And it'll be interesting to see if we get through this, you know, what's going to happen to, say, my grandchildren. What are their cells going to look like? But we can't get so... I mean, black folks now, some black people, not all of them, but some of them, want to believe that there is protection in our education and there is protection in the fact that, you know, we can have these great and wonderful jobs. And I think childbearing bears it out explicitly. Like, it is not protective. We are still very vulnerable health-wise to the stressors around us. I mean, we can all look real pretty, but on the inside, some stuff is going on that we have to acknowledge that our society is taking a toll on us at a cellular level. And I think a lot of people don't want to admit that. They, they want to just move on. And, I mean, I want to move on as well, but I also want to realize that we have had some things happen to us that even though we can move on, we have to move on with the knowledge that we need some extra slash other care. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that. And, you know, I can't do anything about that, but I do know that that is the case. Context of white supremacy. Uh, we'll nab a few of the folks who dialed in 
uh, who have questions. I know uh, for some of the people who questioned the statistics with regards to maternal mortality rates, you can check uh, specifically for the state of Texas, uh, the Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Task Force. Uh, they have the statistics uh, with a racial breakdown for 2011-2012, which shows that black females specifically constitute a little less than 30% of the total uh maternal mortality deaths in Texas for 2011 through 2012. Black females specifically constituted about a little less than 30 percent, even though uh, black people uh, only constitute about 13 percent, a little less of the Texas uh, state of Texas's population. So you can see how overrepresented uh, black females are in that percentage. Uh, some of the folks who dialed in who had questions, I think uh, Thomas and oh, I saw Thomas in New York, and then I missed his hand. So you'll have to dial back in, uh, Thomas in New York, if you have a question for Ms. Turner. Uh, the caller looks like you're on the Skype line. Did you have a question for Ms. Turner? You should be with us. Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, greetings, um, and uh, I appreciate uh, picking up the call. Um, basically, I, I'm, I'm a single father. I, I'm trying to – I actually have uh, two sons, one um, – from uh from a, a a woman of color a black woman and another that was white um i noticed immensely that there was a huge disparity when i when i was in when i was when my, when my initial son was uh giving birth um my initial um girlfriend at the time was giving birth um they were constantly coming in the room these were mainly white nurses and white female doctors. And they were constantly telling us, do you want to use this? Do you want to use that? They were offering so many different types of drugs. And we were somewhat educated in this regard, but it was a very tumultuous kind of um, situation. It, it wasn't easy for us to gather the data and information. And I, I didn't want to impose any of my will on her on how she wanted the childbirth to go. I just wanted her to feel comfortable no matter what. But um, that being said, her friends came to visit. And once I left the room with her friends to say thank you for coming, and uh, we appreciated their support, um, immediately when I came back upstairs, they were in the room already saying that there's an emergency. We have to give birth now. We're going to have to do a C-section. We, we, we can't afford to wait. If we wait now, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, the, the, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And I, and I stopped them and I said, wait, 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 wait. Just a few moments ago, everything was fine. And then shortly after I come upstairs and every, there's an issue. What, what, what occurred? And the doctor, the female doctor, looked at me, uh, white, said, well, well, if you don't want this to be done, if you don't want us to do the C-section, your baby's going to die. And in that instant, I, uh, I, I just became extremely emotional. I just said, go, go ahead, go ahead. And um, they proceeded to do the C-section. Um, I, I noticed, you know, there were the way they treated her let's say in the hospital was just so I, I, it was just, it was just difficult to get anything done without me literally being there constantly. And, um, I was working of course at the time. So I would, you know, I had time off and I made the best of it. I slept there, I stayed there and such forth, but it was almost like I had to enforce that consistently that they would treat her with care. Um, that being said, juxtapose, um, and I'm no longer with the white female, but when she gave birth, it was like, I don't even know. It was like night and day. They would come in. They would say, are you feeling all right? What do you need? Oh, what do you want? To, how do you want the birth to go? Let us know if you need anything. We're going to be right outside the hall. Um, they would run back down, run back up and constantly check in on her. They gave her all the time in the world. They didn't they maybe offered her one drug at one point and that was about it they never came back afterwards you know i was there the whole time of course as well she she had a natural birth no real drugs or anything um afterwards they i mean they gave us a nice suite a room 
they even accommodated him because uh, my son at the time that was born, he had a, a rash and they brought the machine into our suite, which is completely against the norm in the hospital and allowed us to keep the machine in the room with him in it so we could monitor him as well. I mean, this was like completely night and day compared to the treatment that I, I, I saw with uh, my first born. And um, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just reiterating the story. And I, I do have a question also. Um, I'm in, in New York. I've seen that. I've spoken to a lot of other brothers and they tell me that almost every one of my friends, not one of them had a simple childbirth. Every one of them said the umbilical cord was around the child's neck. And because of that, they had to do a C-section. I mean, every single one of them, not one of, and these are, these are all non-white males. They said all their non-white females had to have the same type of birth. And I'm wondering if it's, there's something to that. I don't know if you could expound on that and speak on it in a few. I'll mute my line. Oh, no, no, you're, you're fine. And you're right. <laughs> there is something to that. Um, childbirth in and of itself takes time. It is one of the things that you can't often predict because it's really um, driven by the baby. As the baby works itself down through the birth canal, um, you know, it just takes time. they got to get themselves in the right position, get the little shoulders in, and, and it just takes time. Um, you know, you bring up a really salient point. They don't want to give us time. They don't want to give us the time of day. And so um, there is a saying, and it, it's a horrible saying, but those of us in the medical field know, Highest time, peak times for cesarean sections are around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon and about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night because that's end of shift. And when the doctor wants to go home, the doctor wants to go home. Um, you know, so suddenly everything that could have been going great and wonderful, it becomes, oh, the baby's too big, the shoulders are stuck, and, you know, your baby's having difficulty and you know, we need to take the baby now. Now, most of the time, like you're saying, things are fine. And if something were going on, it would have been going on before then. Most times, complications don't just show up. They, they kind of percolate over time. So the fact that suddenly your partner was in all of this danger and distress, and that is the tactic they use. Do you want your baby to die? You know, well, who wants their baby to die? Nobody wants their baby to die. So that is how they browbeat people into these C-sections because a C-section, quick and dirty, you're in, you're out 40 minutes, and you're done. Labor can last days. And basically the doctor's, they just get to a point where they just don't feel like doing it. Now, add in if your partner is on Medicaid, um, you know, the reimbursement isn't that great. So it's not worth their time. And it's really sad that this is how, um, how we're treated, how we're rated, how much, how much are we worth to them without private insurance, without... Um, what am I trying to say? Whether it be we don't have private insurance or, um, you know, it's just taking a little longer than they want. They want to go home. Uh, they want to deliver the baby. They just want to be done with it. You know, it's not really taking into consideration what's best for the mother and the baby. That then becomes what's best for the doctor. And unfortunately, and I'm so sorry that this happened to you and your partner, this is what's done. And if you notice, they waited till you were out of the room to pull that nonsense. And again, that is one reason I am adamant that I tell women, do not go to the hospital by yourself and don't let someone leave your side. Because you went to walk the friends out and then they started with it. And it's very difficult for a woman if you're in labor, you get tired, you're, you're dealing with contractions, you really can't think straight. But they come in and say, oh, there's a complication. You have to have a cesarean. And you're like, okay, whatever. You weren't there to buffer. 
And by the time you got back, they hit you with something wrong with the baby. Well, you don't know if there was or wasn't because you stepped out for a minute, nothing bad. You know, you did nothing wrong. That was your window of opportunity. And unfortunately, this happens. This is one of the reasons I started the Doula Project because doulas, and one of the reasons I am adamant that partners be there, we tag team. We never leave her. She's never alone. There is not a time when not one of us, you or me, is in the room. And see, with that, they got to watch the P's and Q's because either you're going to rat them out or I am. And that is why dual projects are so important, and especially dual of color. Because, again, now, if we go back to, I was saying, you know, white women are like, oh, well, I don't want to be in a they're not going to buck the system. They're not going to go against the doctor because, oh, well, you know, of course the doctor thinks it's best. So what help is that to us? None. No help whatsoever. So, I mean, yeah, that your story epitomizes why the doula programs that exist around the country and why I started this one in Texas, why we exist because of your very situation. Unfortunately, you know, we don't know. In those moments, something could have happened. Probably not, but we don't know because we weren't there for those few moments. And unfortunately, you know, your, your partner had the birth that she had, but hopefully your son is strong and healthy now, and, and you know, we try to move on from that. But your situation epitomizes the reason why I started Healing Hands Community Doula Project. Exactly. Um, just a, a side note kind of question as well, if, if I may ask. Um, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you feel about that in regards to, I mean, because it's, it's, it's something that I, I um, currently right now with, with my girlfriend, I, I talk to about her with her a lot, and she's, she's non-white. Um, and as a sister, I speak to her quite frequently and say, cause she's a, she's a feminist. She believes in feminism, but I've just experienced so much pushback from white females, um, in regards to my, my children in regards to their, his, their schooling. Um, as, as you could see from, as from the story, I just reiterated in regards to, um, the nurses and the female doctors or female white doctors that, that were doing this, these are all white women. And it's, it's, it's something that I'm still becoming more knowledgeable about. I'm, I've, I mean, I've, I could, I could only have conversations with women that are, um, more, um, knowledgeable in regards to feminism and, and some of the, um, the beliefs and, and some of the aspects. I, I obviously read up on these things as well, because I see the pushback from white women to be just as deadly, if not more deadly than white men most of the time, especially dealing with little black boys and, and black children in school, period, across the board. Um, I just wanted to hear your kind of take on that. You're right. I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> well, it's interesting. My daughter and I, my daughter is my 15-year-old, and she and I were watching... Um, uh, BET's Black Girl Magic, um, whenever it was, and um, talking about it, and she, I guess she went to school, and she, was, she had watched it, and um, somebody had said to her, why, you know, why are you talking about Black Girl Magic? It really jumped kind of down her throat, and she came home, and she said, Mom, you know, People were, you know, I was talking about we were watching the BET uh, Black Girls, Black Girls Rock, that's what it is, Black Girls Rock, and, you know, Tracy Ellis Ross is on there, and Tarashi P. Henson, and, and we had to talk about, I mean, white women, yeah, they can be kind of toxic, and I think there are several, I mean, that this could be a whole podcast in and of itself, but white women have long felt that, um, they were special, and that if I want a black man, I can have him, and I can take him from you. And what one thing that I've noticed with them that is really interesting is that even though they kind of have this mentality of I can have him if I want him, they're very threatened by the fact that black women are here. 
and they know that there's something that they don't have. And so it, it, it's a really weird kind of um, dynamic that they bring in because I've been out with, you know, I have white girlfriends and stuff, and we'll see a black man, and we'll be walking along, and he'll nod at me, and I'll kind of wave at him, just, you know, just acknowledging. And they're like, why is he talking to you? And how do you explain, like, because there's another black person, we acknowledge each other, and, you know, there was nothing overt, nothing sexual. And it, well, are you going to go after him? No, I, I was just saying hi, and he was just saying hi, and but not understanding that there is that link, that commonality. And even though they feel like, well, I, you know, one of my friends, she was talking about her daughters in high school, and, you know, some white girls came up to her like, who are you going to date? Because all the black guys want us. And, you know, that, that attitude of I'm so much better than you and I can have, but underlying that there is this, what is this black girl magic thing? And there, there's this frustration and this need to undercut it, which I think makes it very uh, toxic to our children, to us. To, it, it's very toxic. And, and I agree with what was said about, you know, the teachers, and I watched that with my son. And, you know, it, it can be very toxic. I don't know what to do about it. Um, I see it at times. I know about it but I don't know what to do about it. And I only think that we as black people have to be kind of vigilant and, and be careful. And I mean, you know, for you and your current partner, if you decide to have a child, you know, you've been through the process now, you know what the drill is. And um, I think you said, are you in Manhattan, New York, or Brooklyn, or are you, where are you in New York? Are you in New York? I'm I'm in New York City. Yes, I'm not in I'm not in Manhattan. I'm in Brooklyn. Well, if you're in Brooklyn, if you and your partner, if you and your current partner decide to have a child, there are some excellent doulas there. Um, Denise Bold, she's Bold Doula, and Ancient Song Doula Services. I would highly recommend that you have either Denise Bold, and she's um, a solo practitioner doula or Ancient Song Doula run by Chanel Portia in Brooklyn, um, be there with you guys because I'll tell you, these are some serious sisters. They won't pull that nonsense with them. They will not. And, that, and it'll also give you some extra support. And, again, like if you decide to walk a friend out, someone will still be there with your partner. So, yeah, definitely if you guys decide to have a child, um, Denise Bowles, Old Doula or um, Ancient Song Doula Services. Right on. Link them. I think Miss Jones uh, mentioned Ancient Song Doula Services last week when she was on the program. I posted uh, their uh, website on our web page, on our Facebook page, rather. Uh, appreciate that the mail caller in New York. Uh, if other folks, if you have a question, uh, the caller at 2218, 2218, did you have a question for Miss Turner? You should be with us. Last four digits, 2218, 2218, did you have a question? Uh, um, hi, how are y'all doing? Right poorly. Hi. <laughs> so, um, I am a young black mother. I have a 10-month-old son. And I'm currently pregnant right now. And um, earlier in the program, you mentioned how, like, as mothers, we need to take care of ourselves. And um, I guess I'm kind of struggling with that right now because I guess people make me feel like, um, you know, when I when I say that, like, oh, I need a rest because I'm not feeling good or, like, um, I'm suffering from really bad morning sickness right now. Um, and when I mention that people make it seem like, you know, I'm lying or like I'm being dramatic. Um, or if I say like, I can't like clean something right now, it's like, oh, you're like, you're a bad like housewife or you're a bad mother and things like that. And so it just makes me feel like, um, I'm not allowed to rest or take care of myself because like there's this standard, um, that I need to like live up to. And it's, I don't know. It's just really tough. And, um, 
Yeah, I just feel like I'm not really allowed to take care of myself. So I don't know how to, like, um, I guess, get these voices out of my head. Um, yeah, because I'm really tr- uh, trying to enjoy this pregnancy. My first pregnancy was really tough. I had um, morning sickness for about seven months, and then I lost 15 pounds in one month. And um, our doula and midwife that we worked with weren't very supportive. Um, they didn't really listen to me at all, uh, even when I was in labor. And I was telling them that, like, I feel like my, my son is going to come really soon. They're like, um, oh, no, like, this is your first birth. Like, this is going to take a long time. Um, even though, like, I felt it. Like, I felt his head coming down, and he was born in five hours. And so, Ooh. like, I just feel like I'm always being negated. And I don't, I don't know how to like advocate for myself. Yeah. So I guess. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, you've got kind of the double whammy. You're pregnant, and you got a little one. That right there is enough to make anybody tired. I mean, um, you know, that's just rough because little ones, your ten month old is getting mobile up and creeping and crawling and wanting to see everything. This is the age when you've got to baby-proof your house because they're just in everything. And at the same time, um, you didn't say how far along you are with your second pregnancy, but you're pregnant, and it sounds like you may also be dealing a little bit with some hyperemesis. Are you throwing up a lot? Yes. Yeah, so... Not only are you having morning sickness, you're throwing up a lot, and you're probably a little bit dehydrated, and can you hold anything down? Um, It's very hard. Like, when I eat, I I throw up, like, maybe 20 minutes later. Yeah. Now, are are you getting fluid replacements? Are you getting meal replacements? Have you talked? Are you seeing a midwife or an OB this time? Um, So we have just found a black midwife and then a black doula and we are working along with them but because like because of my first experience I feel like I may ask them for too much or you know I I feel like I don't want to burden them with my problems so I I, I don't know I just I feel like I'm trapped okay where are you I am in Seattle Washington Oh, shoot. Okay, because I don't know of a good uh, dual collective up that way. I know um, the International Center for Traditional Trial Bearing is in Portland. Um, check them out and see if you can find a you, – I mean, if you like your dual, that's fine. But they have um, culturally competent, well-trained doulas and midwives through I- ICTC. And it's right there in Portland, so it's not so far from you. Um, because you need someone who's not only going to advocate for you, but who's also understanding what you're going through. You're, you're having children very close together, which is just a lot on the body. I mean, and anybody who is, you know, in the healthcare realm should know this. But you know, it goes back to that thing of, well, you know, we're black women, we're strong, we can, you know, bite a nail and give birth. No, we don't. I mean, childbearing is hard work. It's a lot of stress and strain on the body. And you don't need to try and be tough. You don't need to be trying to be, they should, you've, you've hired this doula and midwife. They serve you. You're paying them. So they need to be serving you and they need to kind of be sucking it up if they don't like it. And if they're truly not serving you, you kind of need to fire them and find somebody who is going to serve you because you need the doula now. This is kind of what I've been doing with Mamas on Bed Rest. For women who can't hold food down and stuff, they need to be serving you now. They need to be at your home helping keep things going so you can sleep, so you can be drinking soup and broth and things that are easy on the stomach to regain your strength. I mean, losing 15 pounds midway through your pregnancy is not okay. You know, your baby needs all of your calories. You need your calories. So, you know, how you decide to deal with this is how you decide to deal with this. But remember, your doula and your midwife and your obstetrician, all these people work for you, especially 
if you're paying out of pocket to have these people and if they are not serving you, you need to fire them and get someone who's going to actually help you because, you know, you need to be resting. You need to be getting your strength back. I don't know if you work outside of the home or not, but right now it doesn't sound like you can do that physically. I mean, you just can't do that, and your doula should be picking up the slack for you. Mm-hmm. So, so it, you, in other words, like it's, it's not unreasonable for me to like ask for this help then just kind of like expect it no i mean seriously are you paying this woman oh yes we are then yes you know i mean think about it say you worked at i mean anywhere and you didn't show up do you think you'd get paid or if you're not doing the work do you think you're going to get paid no if she is not doing, well, okay, there's two sizes before I say that. I don't know the terms of your contract. So mm-hmm. you do, look at, I don't know what you two agreed to, but I'm saying this, as your doula, she does have a responsibility to make sure that you go through this pregnancy and have a healthy baby. That's the whole reason why you hired her. Now, if she's a doula, like birth doulas, for example, They'll only see you once or twice before the birth, and then they're at the birth and maybe once or twice after. Now, I don't know the terms of your um, the terms of your contract with this doula, but I know, like, and we work with women from time of conception to the first. Year. So we would be we would be that safe net. We do this specifically because. This often happens. I mean, who knows? You know, you get pregnant. No big deal. But it's a lot on your body. You just had a child and now would be getting ready to have another one and having the excessive morning sickness and not able to keep anything down. And, you know, that's our role to come in and help you. Now, I don't, again, I don't know the contract between you and this doula, but you need to try a doula that's going to actually be your birth servant and your birth attendant. (laughs) The name doula means servant. And a lot of black women are like, well, I'm not going to use that term. I'm not going to be, you know, we had enough of slavery and everything else. But no, we're here to serve. That's the point. We're here to serve childbearing women. And if you have a problem with that, you need to really think about what it is you're doing. Now, I highly recommend you check in with ictcmidwives.org. That's where the International Center for Traditional Childbearing is. And they, I am sure, have doulas in Seattle because, you know, Seattle and Portland are so... And find, you know, tell them what's going on and say, you know, I need help. I need someone who is actually going to be able to help me. I know they have um, a doula registry, and they can probably recommend someone, but you need an antepartum doula, which is a lot of what I've done, someone who's going to help you now before you even have this baby so you can get to the point to have this baby because at this rate, you're, you're getting worn down. You might have a preterm birth with this child, and that's not mm-hmm. what you want to do. We don't want that. We want you to go the full 40 weeks, 39 weeks, whatever. You need help. So, you know, first off, see if you can talk to this doula and say, you know, I need help. You know, can you help me? Can you do this? Can't, you know, and see where she is because maybe she doesn't know. I'm going to just toss that out there. Maybe she doesn't know. And, you know, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. But after you speak with her and be very explicit about what you need, if she says, I can't do that, I don't want to do that, or you feel from her that that's not what she wants to do, then you need to find someone who can truly be the doula that you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, no problem with this. 
it's not uncommon, honey. And and you've got to take care of yourself because you've got these little people that are depending on you. And this is not abnormal. You're not asking for the moon. This is just normal care. This this is what doulas do. And, and you know, I, I can't say for well, I sit down with her and say, you know, a meeting right now and, you know, look at the terms of your contract. If you guys have one, see, you know, kind of what was laid out. See if you can change the terms or something because you need help now. And if not, then you have to decide, is this the right person to kind of assist you and attend you through this pregnancy? How far along are you? Uh, three or four months pregnant. Oh, honey, you got a long way to go. You need someone to help you. Mm-hmm. You can't. You can't keep going like this. You know, you you need someone who's truly going to be there to support you. Um, try with this first doula and see if if you know she can do it. If not, check out ictcmidwives.org and um, see if there's someone who could, you know, assist you because you it's going to be critical as you go on that you get rest and that you, you know, your body has its time to strengthen and, and develop this baby. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And, and please take care of yourself. It is so important. Mm-hmm. Do you have yeah. there? Do you have family? Um, <laughs> currently, it's just um, me and my fiance. Um, we're facing. <laughs> we're just having a hard time. Um, his family's here, but they don't really support our relationship. So, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm young, um, and my family is actually in Texas. So oh. I don't know. I just feel like isolated, and I don't really feel like I have people here who I can really turn to and look to for support. Mm. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. Well, definitely check in with ICTC in Portland. And um, I'm trying to think. I don't know a lot of folks up in Seattle, but I know they will know. And mm-hmm. you're going to be, because you need the doula not just for the physical support, but you need the emotional support. You, you need that because it, it's a tough, struggle and you need that support so it's really important that you get someone that really is going to be there for you and um you know if the current doula isn't doing it or isn't willing to step that up then i definitely think you have to maybe consider switching providers um do you like your obstetrician or your midwife or you know are you getting support from them so far, I, I feel like this experience is actually a lot better than um, my first experience. Um, okay. And I, I don't know our midwife too well, but she seems like um, she's a good fit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just tough. It's just tough. Yeah, you need, but you need the social and emotional support. So see if you can work with this doula, and if not, and also, are there any, like, moms groups up there or other, you know, pregnant moms, young moms up there that you could, uh, is there a mocha moms? I think there's a mocha mom. And it wasn't ran by black mothers. And then really? um, there's another group that I'm a part of that's for, like, people of color. But it's, I don't know, it doesn't really seem like they really understand black issues and things like that. Hmm, interesting. A black group not run by black people. Hmm, where have I heard mm-hmm. that? Oh, that's Texas. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. that, unfortunately that happens. Um, man, that's a tough spot. Um, that's a tough spot. Try to see, you know, look for a mocha moms. That would be a good start. Um, I don't know Seattle well at all, so I'm kind of struggling, but, uh, 
definitely try ictcmidwives.org because they offer a lot of birth companionship, birth support, and they may have some ideas for you because they're the closest group I can think of to where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually know of a mom who went there. I was her doula. Just check in with, with Gus and see if we can if we can share like email and stuff because I may have someone who might be able to help you. Um, Gus, is there a way for us to connect for me to connect with this caller? Oh, for sure. Can you, make, can you get her email or something or phone or, or I mean whatever you want to provide for me because I have a client who just relocated back to Seattle. Mm-hmm. And I can ask her, you know, a, a pair, I think she's from there, but I know she's got family there. And they may know of some resources for this lady on the phone, but we have to get her some resources because this is, she can't go on like this. This is going to tear her body up. We have to get her some resources. I can forward you uh, her, con- or I can email you, Miss Turner, her uh, contact information. Uh, so then, yeah, you- that was great because then I can talk with my client and see if I can get them hooked up, or at least talk with my client and say, "What do you know of in Seattle that we can get for her?" Because she needs some help, and we need to get on that for her. I will get that forwarded to you uh, this evening, Miss Turner, and then you can take it from there and drop her an email or, you know, whatever, however you want to contact her. That sounds great. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I will get that from us, and we will we will work on that because, yeah, this is, we need to get you some support, okay? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. sure. Thank you for dialing in. That's uh, and I, I think it's, at least it's been my experience that a lot of times uh, when you have particularly younger uh, black moms when they're in that sort of situation and there's just not resources. In fact, they're scolding and being reprimanded, and you know it's your fault. You did this. And that sort of thing where it's finger wagging. Even uh, in fact, I remember we had the founder of the International Center for Traditional Childbearing on the program, Shafia Monroe. And she said that she has a degree, she's married, uh, you know, she's not on welfare. She's not, not that there's anything incorrect about that, but I mean, just for context, like she's not struggling. She's employed, gainfully employed, her husband's gainfully employed. And she announced that she was pregnant and it was still that sort of, oh my gosh, what did you go and do that? (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Like, um, what is the problem? Why is this something where it's always, if you're a black person and you're having a child, it's, it's looked down upon, but it's, it's certainly not. Let's get you some help. Let's get you some resources. Yeah. Let's, you know, this Absolutely. is. Well, she, Bia has built an amazing organization out there, and I, I don't really know of another one on the West Coast that's doing as much as she's doing. And that's the closest organization that I can think of to Seattle to help the caller. Um, you know, and that, and who will really understand from the cultural perspective that, you know, this is what's needed. This is how we have to help. You know, we do such a disservice to our young women, like, oh, well, you know, she's just laying up there having babies. And, and no, they're not. No, we're not. You know, and it's just ridiculous. And, you know, we all know people who have had children close together. And it is challenging because you are still regrouping in the first pregnancy, and now you have another pregnancy. And, and that's, we know that's a challenge, but... It is what it is. Let's support it. And and we can support the mother through this and get her through this and allow her body to do what it needs to do. But it can't be with the finger wagging, like you're saying. Mm. We can't, you know, and it's not, it's not beneficial, nor is it anybody's business to be judging how she's having her children. That That's up to her. And she and her fiancé, they're taking care of their children. They're taking care of their business. Let's support that family unit instead of tearing it down. Ashe. Context of white supremacy. Uh, 
last few moments while we have uh, Miss Turner in with us. Uh, if you have a question, do not wait till the last minute. Go ahead and get your hand up now. 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we were talking about uh, doulas and the pregnancy process and what have you. And we actually had some folks dial in. We had a male caller uh, and he said that his uh, wife is about to uh, give birth. And he said he wanted to be the doula for his wife. And he wanted to know if there was any resources uh, for black males specifically who would like to train to be doulas. Have you all had any males come to your program and say, hey, I want to go through the training. Hook me up. I have not, but I was reading an article about that, and it's it's a challenge because it's such an intimate time, and when you're going through childbirth, there are varying times when she's undressed, half-dressed, moderately dressed, and, you know, legs here, bottom there, breast here, and so a lot of the women that I have attended their birth, they're okay if that's their partner but they're not okay if it's another male. So that's a challenge. Now, if he's wanting to just be a doula for his wife, that we can work with. And I, I often work with the partners a lot. You know, like, this is what you want to do. You want to, you know, massage her back here. This may be a good time for a cold pack or a warm pack or a this or that. You know, that I can do, but for men, because there have been men who have said, you know, I want to be a doula or men who say, I want to be a midwife. And it's kind of like, okay, hmm. But um, it, it, it's, it's challenging in that midwifery by nature has been the passage of wisdom from woman to woman. That, that's kind of the underlying principle of midwifery, of one woman undergirding another woman as she's ushering in life. Um, some of it would be hard to teach a man just because it's kind of the anatomy and all. I don't think that it's impossible. I just think it would be harder. And I don't know then how does the whole concept of midwifery then move forward. You know, I don't know. There are questions, but in terms of a man really wanting to be a strong support for his partner, absolutely we can do that. Him wanting to support other women, I don't know. That, that gets a little, little easier. Understood. Absolutely. I think the at least the male that was contacting me, he wanted to do it for his partner. That was the context that some of the other folks were, were asking about, which that would definitely make sense. We'd be supportive in line with what we were talking about earlier. Um, do you, with your project, do you have a recommendation with regards to hospital birth, natural birth, or do you just kind of whatever the preference of the folks that you're working with, whatever their preference is? I go with the preference of the mother. I've done um, hospital births. I've done a home birth. Um, they're very different. I mean, I did. I actually had the great pleasure to do a home birth uh, last month, and it was really different because you want to talk low intervention. There was nothing. <laughs> I think we were just there, and it was. But it was so incredibly peaceful on a level that I mean, it was peaceful because. You know, in the hospital, you got the bleep, bleep of the fetal monitor, you got the lights, you got the this, you got the I mean, we had the lights down low, and after a point, she didn't even want music or anything, so it was just really quiet and really still, and that baby just literally kind of slid in. And, you know, she gave like three pushes, and this baby was here, and, and, and we were all kind of like, oh, it was so peaceful and serene, so there is something to be said for the home birth process that that I really don't think you'll see in the hospital. Absolutely not, because there's so much going on and there's so much that they have to do in terms of protecting against liability and we have to have the HEPLOC and we have to have the monitoring. and blah, blah, blah. Um, But at the same time, if there's a complication, there's no better place to be. I mean, for myself, I could never have done a home birth because when I was having my daughter, when things went south, there was not even enough time to move me from one room to the other. And the reason that my daughter and I both survived was that we were in the OR. We were right there. And, I mean, if they had even had to move me from one floor to the next, 
I think it would have been much dicier. So, you know, it's all a matter of context. In the face of an uncomplicated pregnancy, a very healthy woman, healthy baby, you know, you have your pick. I knew I had problems, so I went to the hospital. I went to the major medical center, and in terms of my daughter, it was the absolute right thing to do. Um, you know, and so you have to weigh things like that. Um, you know, there there is no, I don't personally have a preference. I'll go wherever the woman wants to go. But, you know, I have had women who are like, I want to have a home birth, and I know she's got high blood pressure, and I'm kind of like, I really don't think so, because in that setting, she could stroke, and that happens fast, and there's just not enough time to get her to the hospital. Um, So in that case, I say, well, maybe a hospital with a birthing center attached or a hospital where you can have sort of minimal intervention, but they have all the stuff there if you need it, you know, and, and sometimes women don't want to hear that, but in the interest of being at the most safe place for her and for her baby, that sometimes needs to be the case. So it's always very case by case. And, you know, but I don't personally have a particular preference as to where I want to deliver. I'll, I'll go wherever. Right on. Our conversation just throughout the, the course of the discussion this evening, I've been reminded of uh, Harriet A. Washington's book, uh, Medical Apartheid. We read it on our book club last year. She talks uh, a lot in great detail uh, about the history of suppressing uh, midwifery uh, and practices that black people had been doing for years uh, to take care of the mom and the children during the childbirth process to suppress and then take over those uh, practices uh, and to stop home births uh, from happening and to get births happening in the hospital. She covers that all of that material in detail uh, in medical apartheid. Great information that I think adds a lot of historical context to the dialogue we've had uh, over the course of the evening, as well as the the thought, and I hear it on a regular, on a constant basis, this notion that uh, black people being enslaved or because we have experienced centuries of white supremacy, racism, somehow that has made us uh, stronger or more resilient or served as, as some form of inoculation against further abuse. And I just find that to be the most ridiculous uh, reasoning ever uh, that I, I do not hear anyone else uh, being discussed, anyone, any other group of people, uh, it being uh, posited that because they are mistreated or abused because they have suffered that somehow that is going to make them healthier or hardier somehow. And I think it's it's just as ridiculous as it, as it is applied to black people. Renelia Randall, she talked about that when she was on the program. She said that if anything, being abused, generally that compromises your health. Uh, if you keep having traumatic events and being suffering, abused, that sort of thing, it generally does not age your health and help you become a stronger and better person. Same thing. I think we should think about what's happened to black people. Uh, I I just posted the website. Folks can check for more resources, contact information, particularly if we have listeners in the Texas area for the Healing Hands Community Doula Project. I posted on uh, our Facebook pages. I'll tweet it out as well so you can check out uh, more information, contact information, and resources. Uh, Anything that you want to say to the folks before we get ready to sign off, Ms. Turner? I did. I just wanted to come back to... um the previous caller we just had and kind of reiterate and we kind of glossed on this a little bit um, that sometimes while we are talking about white supremacy and everything else sometimes the worst offenders if you will are our own people and I was listening to the young woman saying you know like her family doesn't really support her choice of partner or whatever I mean for us to come around and judge each other, I think is just tragic. And, you know, we have talked throughout this night. You've had, you know, it sounds like you've had all the real major players on your show. We know how toxic our society is to black people. Why do we want to pick that mantle up and further beat ourselves? We have to stop doing that. And we have to stop the assumption that because 
why people say it, then that must be right. Because we do have within our communities and within our cultures that, well, you know, the white way is the right way. And, and so often that is not, it does not hold true for us. Um, you know, I try to do things on a very very individual basis when I'm speaking with people, when I'm, you know, working with a client. But we cannot make that assumption that all white people are bad, nor can we say all black people are good, because I've seen it go both ways. And, and I think we have to be also careful that we are not kind of perpetrating some of the ills that are done to us as well because we're believing that that's what's best because that's what white people are doing. And then, you know, look at them. And, they, you know, don't we, we can't believe that hype. We can't get caught up in that. And I don't think folks so much, um, um, I see it more in the older generation. I mean, I, I know when I was having my kids, my mother was floored that I had a female doctor. And she was like, oh, well. And she kept saying, him, him. And I finally had my doctor come in. I'm like, Mom, it's a her. She was like, oh. It, you know, so older generations sometimes are more accustomed to older white ways. And, and they think that not, I don't know if I'm saying this properly, but, you know, are a little bit more likely to be a little more cutting. And I just think we have to be careful not to cut ourselves and our younger people and our, our, our people. We don't want to become the perpetrators that, you know, other people are. So the, I just wanted to bring that up. And, you know, cut folks some slack. You know, people are all doing the best that they can. And sometimes, you know, people are struggling. And to say, oh, yeah. I'm not one of babies or, you know, they're doing that, you know, he ain't working. We don't, we don't need to do that. We don't need to bring that in. And nor do we have to kind of hide some of these statistics because we're like, it's like our dirty laundry. It's not our dirty laundry. It's what is, you know, so I, I, I guess I want to encourage us as black folks to be kind to black folks and to be supportive of black folks and to take care of the black community and to become the community again, because sometimes, you know, we get a little money, we get a little job, we want to kind of move it on up, so to speak, and not think about the black community. But I, I just want to reiterate, be, black folks, be kind to black folks. I think we try to stress on this broadcast regularly the importance of being patient with other black people. I would definitely hope that that applies to parents, Black mothers, expecting black mothers, there should be extraordinary patience exercised with them. Patience, generosity, care as much as possible. Uh, again, the founder of the Healing Hands Community Doula Project, uh, Ms. Darlene Turner, thoroughly enjoyed having you on the broadcast and uh, hopefully we can have you back on again. I think this is really important subject matter. I think, as I said at the very beginning, uh, a good number of folks, uh, at least people that I've talked to, they've said that they think a part of the problem in terms of ending racism, white supremacy, is going to come down to children, uh, producing healthy black children uh, who are going to solve this problem. If we are serious about that, then I think this is a subject matter we should be returning to on a regular basis. Uh, but thank you so much, Ms. Turner, for spending a bit of your Monday evening with us. Continue the phenomenal work that you're doing down in Texas. And uh, we will definitely, in fact, uh, you should be on the lookout for the email uh, with the contact information for the young mom that we spoke with this evening. Uh, in like the next five minutes, be on the lookout for the email. Oh, great. Well, I, will, I will email her before I go to bed. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Ms. Turner. I really appreciate your help. Oh, well, thank you. And any time, I'd love to come back. And, and thank you so much for having me. Yes, ma'am. Enjoy the rest of your Monday evening, and we will speak soon. Thank you. For sure. Good evening. Bye-bye. Context of white supremacy. Uh, Gus T. Renegade, another broadcast, uh, very important subject matter. Can't emphasize enough 
Uh, we talked about that. Dr. Welsing talked about that all the time. Uh, not joking around with sexual intercourse, like having a plan, talking about some of these issues, what type of uh, pregnancy you want to have. Do you want to have a hospital birth, home birth, doulas, the midwives, really looking at as much information as you can in advance, taking it really seriously, putting an extraordinary value on on black children. I definitely think that will help us to solve this problem and being patient with black parents, black mothers, black fathers, black children, exercising as much patience uh, as we can. I think that would go a long, long way to trying to solve this problem. Just remember, remembering we're all victims of racism. All of us are being subjected to uh, extraordinary terror and stress on a daily, hourly basis. Uh, again, we'll be here uh, on Wednesday. Dave Newhart, white male suspected racist, should be on the broadcast. Normal time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can check out he wrote the book Alt America. And he's been doing some reports over the past few months or so advertising the book. It's a new book. It just came out uh, a few weeks ago this year. Uh, with that, uh, it has been a tough day, tough experience, tough existence on the whole, but tough day for Gus T. I was not even going to do the broadcast today, but soldier through uh, under the system of white supremacy and hoping we're giving out some constructive info. Uh, so not going to hang out too long. I'll check in. Retired firefighter in Florida. Good to hear from you, sir. Did you have a commentary you wanted to share? Uh, yes, I uh, I tuned in uh, a little bit uh, a little bit late, but uh, kind of didn't want to uh, chime in uh, while the guest was there because I was wanted to basically hear, uh, for the most part, uh, the females uh, because I thought it was more vital uh, for for them to uh, ask questions and and the one caller who had a had a uh, immediate issue and problem. Uh, uh, I was listening to that, and hopefully uh, she would get that uh, corrected and help her during that time in her uh, life. Uh, it's, it's very vital uh, to uh, our females as well as non-white black people in general uh, at that time where we all should support that expected mother to the best of our ability. Uh, my experience is uh, as a uh, first responder, uh, been on quite a few uh, calls involving uh, pregnancy uh, to the point of even uh, assisting and delivering uh, children. Uh, and uh, for the most part, I would say from my memory, 99.9% of them were non-white black females and their children, and it, and it didn't always work out well. Uh, and it's, an, it's kind of synonymous as, as far as what I was hearing from the, uh, from the guests. Also from some of the other callers, uh, I myself, my offspring, uh, did not uh, uh, had had a uh, 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 what is it called when you when the when the uh, child is cut out the cut out of the mother uh, uh, C section boy <laughs> C section that exactly C section uh, uh, it was it was done with my uh, offspring uh, approximately twenty twenty one years ago uh, and I had the uh, a uh, place of actually witnessing uh, it uh, because I was in uniform at the time. So, you know, the doctor knowing that uh, I guess that uh, me as a first responder is used to uh, such, such things uh, was right there. So it does happen a lot with, with uh, black females. Uh, the excuse in our case was it the doctor said uh, to my son's mother that uh, her pelvis, something about her pelvis, pelvis being 
uh, so narrow, it'd be better that she had a C-section instead of uh, the normal uh, birth uh, track, uh, which I thought was kind of strange. But nevertheless, you know, uh, part of the global system of racism and white supremacy, uh, our very lives, for the most part, is in the hands of a lot of white people, which is catastrophically uh, terrible in that situation, but it's reality for the most part. And, uh, but there are things that we could, uh, do to improve that situation. Uh, Mr. Fuller talks about planning before even things get serious, let alone talking about sex. Uh, and you know, and there's many, many more things. Dr. Welsing also talked about, talked about the subject of course a lot. And uh, there are some things that we could be doing uh, and focusing on because as I think I heard you mention, it's, it's a very, in very, very important aspect of, of us uh, uh, coming to the point of neutralizing the system of racism and white supremacy. And it's gonna start with the uh, transition of uh, those of us who are alive and well and well, not well, but alive anyway, and, uh, uh, maximizing the, uh, the, the, uh, infant child growth period, uh, is very vitally important, uh, to neutralizing the system of racism and white supremacy. And that's basically what I, what, what my thoughts are on the subject. Thank you for listening. Appreciate that retired firefighter. Uh, indeed, I will say it again. Dr. Welsing, uh, she said it on this broadcast repeatedly, almost every time that she visited with us. Uh, when you play around with sex, the joke is on the offspring. I uh, just think it's extremely important uh, to value uh, black children uh, and to value, appreciate, be patient and helpful. Uh, any black parents uh, expecting black mothers uh, to just try to be as helpful and nourishing as we possibly can uh, under conditions that are designed to be the exact opposite for every single black person, black children, black mothers, pregnant black mothers is designed to be terroristic. And you see evidence of that every single day. Uh, that said, again, thanks to <clears throat> all the folks uh, who dialed in call to participate during the broadcast. Uh, man, hope it was of constructive value. Uh, thanks to the folks who called in to share about their personal experience. I mean, man, talking about being traumatized while your, your child is being born or while you're pregnant, just that is, again, not the easiest thing to talk about. But the system of white supremacy, it infects uh, all these different areas, uh, hopefully giving out constructive information to help us get a better understanding of that and some suggestions to help neutralize some of these problems as we work to ultimately replace white supremacy with justice. We'll be here Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, suspected, uh, suspected racist David Newart. Uh, I will again stress, I think we did ask about that this evening, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Lots of evidence that racists, they have done a lot to exploit and take advantage of non-white people when we are intoxicated, not thinking clearly, not able to make the best decisions. I think it would be in our best interest. I know Dr. Welsing would certainly recommend let's be sober. Let's protect our brain computer as best we can, our health as best we can so that we can think of solutions permanent solutions to the problem white supremacy racism if you're going to be out and about in a vehicle you certainly want to be sober and buckled up let's do everything we can to minimize contact with race soldiers that's it creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each 
and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's brother. Your problem? You're a victim. Man, I'm up. a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>